Hello, World Wide Web. I am Becker Shadow, the internet personality with the best hair. Now, it's been a couple of months, but I managed to pull together enough after the big move, so here we are again with another... Wait, what, what the... What's going on? Creepy! What are you doing here? This is supposed to be my big comeback review. I don't remember inviting you. You didn't. I hacked my way into your transmission. Listen, I've said it to Tim Deanna before. There is no transmission to hack into. I'm still recording. This video hasn't even been processed yet. It's not my fault you wouldn't answer any of my emails. Besides, the direct approach tends to work better in getting your attention. <sighs> Fine. What do you want? Where's that comic you promised me? Uh... What comic? The one you promised you'd help get off the ground. Months ago. Uh... You're beginning to break up. Answer me. Ah, don't do that! How the heck are you able to make your voice do that anyway? You promised me a comic, Decker. Do you want to find out what I do to people who don't keep their word? Listen, I've been busy. There was the documentary, and getting moved into the new place, and I didn't get that Surface Pro like I wanted to. Try again, Decker. And I really wanted the Pro. Oh, for the love of Joe Gage's sex files, don't start this again. <sighs> this is what I get for collaborating with mortals on a project. Stop looking at me like that! None of this is my fault. I've got problems of my own. I want the pro. <sighs> Listen, what movie are you reviewing? Ah, a guilty pleasure of mine. Demolition Man, starring Sylvester Stallone and Sandra Bullock. You enjoy Demolition Man? And why not? It's a very good film, and highly underrated in my opinion. I love Demolition Man! One of the few Stallone films I can sit through without feeling bored or wondering what the hell he's saying. You didn't like Rocky? Decker, Stallone didn't star in the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I was Peter Henwood. <laughs> uh, never mind. As long as you're here, do you want to do the review with me? Really? Well, people seem to enjoy when we do crossovers together, so why not? Since you're already here, you might as well help me milk a few more cents out of this thing. Great! Wait. Am I getting a cut of the profits? We open with a panning shot of the Hollywood sign. And it's on fire! Is this supposed to be a metaphor for something? Probably. Several quick shots reveal the city of Los Angeles in the year 1996, which was only three years after this film was made. Our protagonist, John Spartan, played by Sylvester Stallone, is being flown via helicopter over mayhem that makes the infamous LA riots look like a night at the Roxbury. Spartan is on a manhunt for a maniac who kidnapped a busload of civilians and is hiding them in the middle of this war zone. I got a real bad hunch where those passengers are where that maniac is. You want to share it with us? Phoenix. Simon Phoenix. Oh, and, um, spoiler alert, I guess. Sparing a moment to look manly in front of the camera, Spartan then drops feet first into the middle of the battlefield. This action sequence is spot on for excitement, though it's so gratuitous at times it almost looks like a video game. Phoenix, played by Wesley Snipes, notices Spartan going for the high score and prepares for his arrival. What? What? What you got, soldier boy? Do something. Go ahead! <laughs> you up to your ass and gasoline. <laughs> because, of course, Spartan has no sense of smell and has to be told when hundreds of gallons of gas has just been poured all over the floor. Well, shit, never mind that. The movie's already over. What are you talking about? It's not the liquid, but the fumes that are flammable. That amount of gas plus that torch equals two rotisserie characters in one very short action movie. Well, if it makes you feel better, they do catch fire eventually. <laughs> yeah. 
This is a great scene to introduce us to Snipes' character, though, which comes off like a mix between Dennis Rodman and Mark Hamill's Joker. Where are they, Phoenix? Now, where did I put them? <laughs> I swear, I'd lose my head if it wasn't attached. <laughs> Their friendly exchange is cut short, however, as the fire spreads to stockpiles of C4, which in reality would merely burn slowly, but in an action movie... It explodes. Again, if it didn't, Decker, you'd be complaining about that. After running away from the huge explosion that again somehow does not end the movie right here and now, Spartan brings the maniac to the rest of the police, who seem to be a little better at investigation than he is. The body's everywhere. There must be 20 or 30. They're everywhere. You see that, Captain? I told him. He said he didn't care. Oh my God, could you sacrifice all those innocent people? As a result of what the bureaucrats see as gross incompetence, Spartan is sentenced to be cryogenically frozen for 70 years. During this time, his hostile behavior will be modified via subliminal suggestive programming. I must applaud the tech display to the cryogenic scene, though, as freezing living creatures causes cell damage because of the size of the ice crystals formed when frozen slowly. This unexplained blue ball, however... completely solves that problem. Wait, you can't forgive the gas fumes or the C4, but the unexplained blue ball is perfectly okay with you. Sure, why not? Well, if you like balls, you're in luck. They were really milking the fact that Stallone stripped down for this film. You can practically make a drinking game out of the number of ass shots. Did I get an eyeful of Stallone's cock just now? It's a stunt dick. Imagine how much worse it was for people seeing this film on the silver screen. And there's another one! <clears throat> we cut to the year 2032 in the megalopolis of San Angeles, where Lieutenant Lenina Huxley, our Deuteranganist played by Sandra Bullock, is checking up on the San Angeles cryo prison on her way to work. I'm hereby querying you on the prison population update. Does the tedium continue? Your earnest questioning is as amusing as it is irrelevant. The prisoners are ice cubes. They never move. What? That looks like a pro. Mm, bulky and expensive, sure, but are you that starved for a tablet that everything is starting to look like a pro to you? Maybe. Why do you always fall for the crazy ones, Creepy? Wait, what? These short series of scenes establish that the world as we know it has ended, and has been replaced by a society that I can best describe as peaceful to the extreme. The only one who seems upset with this at all is Huxley, who is not at all subtle with her opinion. Do you really long for chaos and disharmony? <sighs> what I wouldn't give for some action. Right on cue, they just so happen to be rolling Phoenix up for his parole hearing, scheduled several years before Spartans, because, despite his list of crimes being much more gruesome, you always have to give the bad guy the advantage in the beginning of these movies. Teddy Bear. Advantages that include knowing passwords and security codes to all the major systems and minor ophthalmology. Retina coding accepted, Warden William Smithers. Be well. Yeah, you too. Aww, he has his parole officer's eyes. Lame. Sorry, I'm still a little rusty. His escape doesn't go undetected, but the police don't even recognize the emergency codes, and by the time they do figure out what's going on, they still don't have a clue what to do about it. Condition critical. Vital signs failing. Imminent death. Subject deceased. A familiar scene to anyone who has ever had the pleasure of waiting for police assistance. Uh, did you get into some trouble I don't know about, Creepy? Oh, not me, but I know I can get down there and do whatever I want to you long before any help arrives. <laughs> That's, uh, nice. By the time the police figure out it's Phoenix, he manages to kill one of the doctors and steal their car. This car is trackable on their system, but we still have enough time before the police arrive to get interrupted by random plotline.
Friendly. friendly. Don't, Don't you have, have a job, job to, to do? do? Don't, Don't you, you have, have someone, someone to, to kill? kill? Someone, someone to kill? To kill. Someone, to someone to kill? What the hell was... Don't ask me! I assumed you were overlaying a scene from the Alfred Hitchcock Hour! He regains his composure long enough to Google for a weapon, but isn't pleased by the Wikipedia article he finds. As a pistol, a Look, piece. I don't need a history lesson. Come on, Hal! Where the goddamn guns? You are fined one credit for a violation of the verbal morality standard. What? Fuck you! In accordance with a peaceful, loving society, almost everything is illegal, including foul language. Well, shit, good to know my show will be removed from the internet in 19 years for being obscene. Decker, it's just a movie. Oh. Yeah. All right. The police show up and ask Siri what course of action they should take. Maniac is imminent. Request advice. With a firm tone of voice, demand Maniac lie down with hands behind back. And in all these decades, they still haven't fixed all the bugs in the program, as Phoenix beats the officers senseless, fries the security cameras for several blocks, and blows up a car for good measure. As Police Chief George Earl, played by Bob Gunton, is completely clueless how to apprehend Phoenix, he calls Nigel Hawthorne, whom plays the role of Dr. Raymond Cocteau, the leader and creator of the peaceful society where they live. It I want you to do everything in your power to snare this agent of destruction. You have my utmost confidence. So his advice is to just keep trying! You'd think that much would at least be obvious. Utmost confidence. Hmm. Did he just laugh? You'd think that much would be obvious. Man, you are rusty. After some convincing by the other members of the police force, the chief agrees to thaw out Spartan early, which grants us even more shots of Stallone's assets. <clears throat> Jeez, at this rate I'm never going to be able to look at that smiley face in the same way again. When Spartan is thawed out, they are kind enough to tell him that his wife died years ago, every food and drink he could possibly enjoy is now illegal, and of course, to top it all off, Simon Phoenix escaped and has been killing people. It is determined he will attempt to set up a new drug lab and form a crime syndicate. That is correct. Chief George Earl. Look, I hate to interrupt you two lovebirds, but that's really fucking stupid. Do you think he wants to start a business? Phoenix is going for a gun, plain and simple. Sheesh, the government has every time I've Googled Spider Babe on file, yet the computer didn't even check Phoenix's search history? As the protagonist declares, so it is true. Phoenix is at the museum, eager to steal the guns that, for some reason, have been stored in perfect working order with ammunition. You gotta wait that 15-day waiting period? Or can I just, like, take one now? Oh, motherfucker! You are my... And as luck would have it, the plastic turns into glass just in time for him to break it with someone's help. Wait a minute, this is the future. We're all the phase of guns. Phoenix's rampage continues, which triggers a lockdown in the museum, trapping him inside as Spartan arrives with Huxley and Garcia in tow. Stallone's the star of this movie, however, so Huxley and Garcia wait outside so he can confront Phoenix by himself. At which point things begin to unravel. Bad aim, Blondie. Spartan? John Spartan? Oh shit, they let anybody into this century. What the hell are you doing here? As Phoenix is making his escape, he happens to come across Dr. Cocteau, who arrived to investigate the destructive rampage. Now, don't you have a job to do? Huh? Isn't that a thought repeating in that barbaric brain of yours? The name Friendly. Mr. Edgar Friendly. Don't you have someone to kill? You know, correct me if I'm wrong here, but something about this guy doesn't seem quite on the up and up. Nothing escapes your razor-sharp mastery of observation, does it, Decker? No, it doesn't.
Spartan arrives to chase Phoenix away, interrupting their conversation. He doesn't question Carto just yet as to what was going on, and before long, Lenina arrives with reinforcements. He's finally matched his meat. You really licked his ass. Awed by Spartan's bravery, Cocteau invites him and Lieutenant Huxley to dine with him at Taco Bell later that night. Hey, that isn't fair. Creepy, how come you didn't treat me to Taco Bell when I chased that crazy-looking bastard away from your place last time? That was our mailman, Decker. Incidentally, he's filed a restraining order against you. Still on the case, Spartan begins piecing together where Phoenix might be hiding, because paper money is no longer used and all transactions are conducted via a biochip implanted into each citizen's hand, Phoenix has few places to run to. It'd be a waste of time to mug somebody. Unless he rips off someone's hand, let's hope he doesn't figure that one out. However, the Chief has already concocted a brilliant plan of his own. Before we More importantly, we already have a backup plan. We can just wait for another code to go red. And when Phoenix performs another murder-death kill, we'll know exactly where to pounce. Great plan. That night, Spartan and Huxley dress in their finest for dinner at Taco Bell with Cocteau. In the valley, valley of the jolly green giant. Good things from the guy. Oh, don't start this nonsense. It took me days to get I'm going humanoid over you out of my head. Garden in the valley. Valley of the Jolly Green Giant. No, 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 we're not doing this. Next scene. The dinner conversation leaves a bit to be desired, since most of Cocteau's guests spend their time insulting Spartan in loquacious ways. What would you say if I called you a brutish fossil, symbolic of a decayed era, gratefully forgotten? I don't know. Thanks. Spartan reveals to everyone that he remained conscious while in a frozen state, which contradicts Cocteau's public stance that cryogenically frozen humans have no self-awareness. Huxley is stunned by this revelation, but Spartan spots suspicious behavior across the street and leaps into action. Weren't these guys in the Road Warrior? Actually, I think these guys should have been in Road Warrior, but the director for that film cast the local S&M club instead. Spartan makes quick work of the Scraps, who are outcasts that live in the tunnels beneath San Angeles away from Cocteau's ideal society. The fight is short-lived, but Spartan balks when he realizes the scavengers were only looking for food to eat. Hurting people's not a good thing. Well, sometimes it is, but not when it's a bunch of people looking for something to eat. Bristling from Spartan's words, Cocteau returns to his office to find that Phoenix has made some modifications. Nah. I've changed that. Illuminate. Deluminate. <laughs> Ooh, isn't that nicer? Phoenix has deducted that Cocteau is the reason that he now has lead hacking computer skills and monkey kung fu powers. Cocteau altered Phoenix's cryogenic programming and gave him all the access codes so that Phoenix could assassinate Edgar Friendly, a social anarchist and reluctant leader of the Scraps, who is played by Dennis Leary of all people. Phoenix actually complies with Cocteau's insistent demand that he kill Friendly, but requests that Cocteau thaw out several more criminals to make the job go much easier. And I'm sure Phoenix doesn't have a single ulterior motive. Have you been drinking out-of-season Nog recently? Of course that psycho has an ulterior motive! Oh, now you're starting to catch on? Meanwhile, Huxley and Spartan arrive at her apartment complex. Huxley has pulled some strings and secured Spartan a domicile there as well. However, before showing Spartan to his own room, Huxley has a request. I was wondering if you would like to have sex. Damn, I can't wait for the future now. Not if women ask you for sex right off the bat like that. Uh, I'm afraid it's a little more complicated than that. What's wrong? He broke contact. Cut contact? I didn't even touch you yet. Huxley explains to Spartan and the audience that Cocteau outlawed sexual contact of any type after an outbreak of several new STDs ravaged the population, meaning that even kissing is considered taboo. This doesn't jazz well with Spartan at all, and when he tries to put his player moves on Huxley, she isn't receptive. You are a savage creature, John Spartan, and I wish you to leave my domicile now. That's telling him, Huxley. 
Retreating to his own apartment, Spartan takes a moment to explore the place before settling down. Hi, Martin. You know, I was thinking. Oh my god, I'm sorry, wrong number. So in the future, women call you on vid phones while naked. <laughs> I'm definitely looking forward to the future now. They outlawed sex, remember? The most you'll ever do is look. Fuck! Well then I guess this qualifies as the film's blue-thonged gay stripper moment, huh? By the way, I'm sending you a bill for using that clip. Are you kidding me? You got it from a gay musical porno. How is it I'm the one being billed here? Don't try to push me. There are other porn films out there I could subject you to instead. Ha! <laughs> I've already sat through Playmate of the Apes and a gay go-go dancer in a banana hammock. What more can you throw at me? How would you like to sit through Dark Alley Media's erotic interpretation of The Passion of the Christ? Spartan examines a video footage of Phoenix's escape from the museum, or rather, clips from earlier in the movie, and becomes suspicious of both Cocteau and the Doctor's mysterious control over Phoenix. Thanks to his behavioral modification programming, Spartan is able to knit a present for Huxley by the next morning as an apology, which she happily accepts. Convinced he's on the right trail, Spartan has Huxley access Phoenix's rehabilitation programming. Urban combat kill, torture methodology, computer override authority, survival some tactics, mistake. terrorism tactics, weapons training, martial arts, murder death kill, explosives technician, violent behavior. This isn't a proper rehabilitation program. No kidding. I think I figured out where you learned your deductive reasoning from, Decker. Don't try to flatter me. I will not watch that Jesus of a gay passion porno with you. Spartan is all for confronting Cocteau about his possible involvement in Simon Phoenix's escape and murderous rampage, but Huxley tries to put the kibosh on things right away. No, John Spartan, you do not accuse the savior of our city of being connected with a multi-murder death killer like Simon Phoenix. It's... rude. Nevertheless, the two end up interrogating the good doctor moments later. I wonder about this shithead. John Spartan, you if you are think you've got this maniac under control, control, trust me, you don't. Spartan's gun-toting and accusations lead to Cocteau ordering Huxley to return Spartan to cryostasis at once. John handles this with his standard grace and subtle reasoning. Be well. Be fucked. John Spartan, you are fine. One... <gasps> left with few options, Spartan goes looking in the one place left where Simon Phoenix might be, the underground system of tunnels beneath San Angeles. Against orders, both Huxley and Garcia decide to follow Spartan down to the scrap's turf. I'm with you. Let's go blow this guy. Away. Blow this guy away! Whatever. Not a word, creepy. Not one word. Their search for Phoenix quickly takes a detour when Spartan gets the first whiff of cooked meat he smelled since being defrosted. And since there aren't any cattle down there in these tunnels, guess where the meat for that burger came from? Esta carne es de rata. Rat. Actually, here in the United States, certain breeds of rat are considered a delicacy. For example, the Koipu, or as it is more commonly known, the Nutria rat, is a stable in Louisiana cuisine. You don't have to explain that to me. Orleans is just a hop, skip, and a jump across the river from where I live. I wasn't telling you, I was telling the audience. Not bad. Matter of fact, it's the best burger I've had in years. Gracias, señor. <laughs> Leaving the rat burger stand, Spartan and company maneuver through the tunnel community's people, though the locals seem a little less than enthused by their presence. Yeah, that's how some people react whenever I walk down a busy city street. I'd love to give you that. A new car! A 1970 Oldsmobile 442 with a 455 cubic inch engine, radial tires, and, and bucket seats. I'm impressed. And I am so turned on for some reason. So am I. Hey, 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 you just keep your distance, pal. You know, Decker, there is such a thing as protesting too much. Huxley and Spartan are so entranced by the pretty red car that they don't notice Friendly and his goon squad sneaking up behind them. 
At first, Friendly is not quite so friendly towards them for invading his turf, mistakenly assuming Cocteau sent them into the tunnels to drag him topside so he can stand trial. Spartan is able to get Friendly to back off, though, by revealing his mutual distaste for Cocteau's way of life. So stay here, be well, and Cocteau's an asshole! Hey, hey, in response, Friendly deconstructs Cocteau's philosophy in what I consider to be the highest point of this entire film. See, according to Cocteau's plan, I'm the enemy. Because I like to think. I like to read. I'm into freedom of speech and freedom of choice. I'm the kind of guy who likes to sit in a greasy spoon and wonder, gee, should I have the T-bone steak or the jumbo rack of barbecue ribs with the side order of gravy fries? I want high cholesterol. I want to eat bacon and butter and buckets of cheese, okay? I want to smoke a Cuban cigar the size of Cincinnati in a non-smoking section. I want to run through the streets naked with green jello all over my body reading Playboy magazine. Why? Because I suddenly might feel the need to, okay, pal? I've seen the future. You know what it is? It's a 47-year-old virgin sitting around in his beige pajamas drinking a banana broccoli shake singing, I'm an Oscar Mayer wiener. In other words, Cocteau's lifestyle is what happens when extreme liberalism pulls a 180-degree turn and rams into the tail end of the Republican Party. You've actually done that before, haven't you? What? The naked-down-the-street part? Yeah. Not covered in green jello, no. Realizing who Friendly is, Spartan breaks the news that Cocteau is trying to assassinate him. Discussing the situation in a calmer setting, who would happen to show up but Phoenix himself? Oh, 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 I must have done something right in a previous life. Can't imagine what that could have been. The scene immediately erupts into a shootout with Spartan and friendly scraps fighting against Phoenix and his cryocons. After some impressive cinematography gets the better of Phoenix, he flees to the surface. Which transitions directly into a car chase, as Spartan discovers the elevator shaft, which evidently can bring the lift even higher than the shaft itself. As the chase ensues, Phoenix takes a few shots at Spartan, damaging the classic vehicle, though strangely enough not breaking the back windshield of his own car. That's not too outlandish, really. Excuse me, how is a self-fixing window not too outlandish? Shit. Auto inflate! Auto inflate. There's that example. True, but... The other one was just a continuity error, plain and simple. Was it now? You've been getting way too many messages from people trying to defend Prometheus, haven't you? Yes. As the chase continues, Spartan leaps onto Phoenix's car and tries to apprehend him. Phoenix, however, has some exposition to spill. Remember those 40 plus passengers that you flew apart trying to catch me? They were already dead! <laughs> oh, wait a minute. That's an awful damn weird thing to bring up just out of the blue, and spoken conveniently whenever you can't see his mouth. Your point? I smell a line added after the filming was over. Maybe, but at least it fits the earlier scenes with the fact that Spartan said he didn't find the hostages on a thermal scan. Oh, but the self-healing glass was just stupid. Yes, it was. Spartan throws Phoenix from the vehicle, but soon finds it's been damaged quite a lot in the fight, and he can't stop it. Which is about 94 minutes, so... Damn, I did not expect the film to end quite so suddenly. And like that. That's Spartan is doing now? That's Spartan! Who are you thinking of? I'm I take it back. The car jizzing inside itself to save Spartan's life was stupid. Self-healing glass sounds far more reasonable. The entire police force is here to arrest Spartan, so he calmly walks past them and finds that a huge scrap army has made its way to the surface, presumably undetected, and thankfully willing to provide him with firearms. Use these weapons of mass destruction against men and women who uphold the law? I use these weapons to shop for groceries. Huxley also sides with Spartan, and tells the Chief something she's been meaning to say for this whole film. Chief, you can take this job, and you can shovel it, hmm? At least she has a firmer grasp on 90s slang than Decker seems to have on reviewing right now. Hey! While this is going on, Phoenix has made it back to Cocteau, and evidently told him that Friendly is dead, as Raymond starts musing about being free to create his perfect society. The purity of an ant colony, and the beauty of a flawless pearl. Look, you can't take away people's right to be assholes. Hmm? 
That's who you remind me of. An evil Mr. Rogers. Will you please kill him? Oh, you mean to tell me he had the foresight to prevent Phoenix from being able to kill him, but didn't put that failsafe into any of the other cryocons? No. No, he didn't. Cocteau's assistant wastes no time jumping over to Phoenix's side and quickly informs Phoenix that Spartan and Huxley have arrived. Phoenix sends his goon squad to keep Spartan preoccupied while he executes his villainous coup de gras. Wait just a darn second here. If Huxley grew up in an enlightened, peace-loving society, where did she learn to fight like that? Um, never mind. That man has died by my hands. It was either him or us, Huxley. Only well, other yeah, is that. Hmm, glad to see she's capable of dealing with her first kill so efficiently. Anyway, where the hell did you learn to kick like that? Oh, um, Jackie Chan movies? Ah. You do not learn kung fu from watching wuxia flicks! And the moving, character-developing moment falls flat due to a cheap joke. Finding the flambéed remains of Cocteau, Huxley offers the doctor last rites before checking the computer monitors. Phoenix, it seems, is gearing up to release all the life-sentenced cryocons onto San Angeles, none of whom have rehabilitation programming. Realizing their final confrontation is at hand, Spartan renders Huxley unconscious with her own glow stick just as she achieves a realization about violence being necessary under certain circumstances. That hardly seems fair. Huxley's proven she's able to take care of herself. How come she has to be left behind? Logistically, she doesn't have the same experience in training Spartan does and would likely be hurt. Production-wise, it's bad form for the hero to be upstaged by the sidekick character during the big fight at the end. Huh. Right. So I hope my butt didn't look like that. And we're back to this again. Now that wasn't Stallone's ass. That doesn't count. Whatever keeps you from waking up in the middle of the night. Great! Absolutely great! Does that one count, Decker? <laughs> Cut it out already! Spartan crashes Phoenix's party via the main entrance, then poses in front of the camera one final time before going in to put a stop to Phoenix's plan. The decryo process is in its final phase, meaning Spartan has but minutes to stop Phoenix and shut the computers down before... Accessed. What the hell is that? And yet another cryocon ass shot. How much man-ass did the producers think this film needed? Hey, it's future realism. The action sequence takes off with Phoenix catching Spartan in the biggest claw game ever built and Associate Bob running for his life. With the two of them alone, Phoenix toys with Spartan, firing wildly at him while singing along with the climactic music. Of course, a hose is busted, which happens to be pumping nitrogen, freezing the metal and making it brittle enough for Spartan to break free. Phoenix then lashes out with a laser cutter, and after that doesn't work, smashes the focus lens. Oh, there was toying with him instead of just killing him. Telling him the truth about the hostages, though honestly he hasn't even reacted to that yet. Oh, and there's your armor made out of tires. What are you afraid of that that amount of rubber will be able to stop? With all the man-ass in this film, do I really have to answer that question? Point taken. Now both toe-to-toe -to -toe and unarmed, they stop to reminisce about the beginning of the film. Is it cold in here, or is it just me? With all that out of the way, Phoenix starts beating the absolute crap out of Spartan in a decidedly one-sided brawl. Before he kills him, he takes the time to posture a bit. This is the best day of my life! Well, given the angle, he's just gotta thrust down a few feet and boom, Spartan shish kebab, where John has to swing the whole thing around and turn it 180 degrees, so clearly the odds are stacked in the favor of... Decker, don't tell me you've forgotten how action movies work. The laws of physics don't apply to the climax. Oh, yeah. The magic blue ball of Instafreeze spreads over the floor and walls, and Spartan somehow has the energy left to quickly escape its path and deliver the one-liner before double-killing Phoenix. Heads up!
Of course, the entire cryoprism is built out of explosives, it seems, as now frozen solid, everything starts to blow up. Spartan runs away from the huge blast, bringing us to our story's end. With Cocteau dead, the peaceful society has no idea where to go from here, and we are given a very ambiguous happy conclusion where the people won't be so uptight and the scraps are allowed back into society. And Spartan gets the girl, of course. Of course, Decker. I mean, sure, she was raised to abhor physical contact, but no matter what, at the end of an action movie, the hero always gets the girl. So that's how it works, huh? Hmm. Oh, uh, well, that was Demolition Man, and uh, it's one of my favorite movies. Are there logical flaws and issues with reality in this movie? Of course, but those that deal with the main plot are actually quite few. Suspended animation has to be one of the best methods for realistically depicting time travel, and while some decisions of Cocteau can be seen as stupid coming from a societal leader, considering the world's state, he could easily be naive or drunk with power. One gripe I must say I had is that Sandra Bullock has some pretty dry line deliveries, but fortunately, her trying and failing to emulate the 90s matched pretty well with her acting ability in this movie. Overall, Demolition Man is a cheesy action flick with a pretty smart sci-fi paint job. All flavors of things I love with too few flaws for me to be too hung up on, easily earning five naked phone calls out of five. The fact is, this film flubbed back when it was first released. The reason for that, I think, has to do with the way it was pitched to audiences. This film is not a classic action sci-fi genre blend, but rather a comedy satire that deconstructs both the peaceful future utopian society setting and the action hero stereotype to great effect. Die Hard action fans, both literally and otherwise, will no doubt be put off by this, but for me, Demolition Man secures four solid swearometer citations out of five. I'd recommend it for fans of action and comedy. It's honestly not the easiest film to riff, as it spends a good amount of time making fun of itself. Thank you all for watching, I've been... Decker. What? This isn't over. Yeah, it is. I'm just about to roll credits. You know what I mean. The comic. Well. Thank you all for watching. I've been Decker Shadow. And remember, don't make promises to creepy that you only maybe can keep. Your repeated violation of the verbal morality statute has caused me to notify the San Angeles Police Department. Please <laughs> remain where you are for your own command. Yeah, right. <laughs> Focus are fast too. You are